Dead even to mention the stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with The Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Rackvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me, noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. <laughs> Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. No spin, no buyers, no censorship. I'm Dan Wharton tonight. Just Stop Oil now on a fourth consecutive day of deranged protests on the M25 are a doomsday cult hell-bent on inflicting pain on ordinary Brits. They think they're getting me down to safety, but it's just as dangerous down there as it is up here. <laughs> but super... <laughs> Sorry, I mean, just ridiculous. But at least Superwoman Suella Braverman is right about the fact that indulgent police are now part of the problem. So in my digest next, I joined the Home Secretary in urging coppers to stop putting the rights of eco-extremists over those of ordinary folk. I'll get the view of my superstar panel too. Joining me tonight, Carol McGiffin, Sean Bailey and Amy Nicole. Following reports that just 710 of the 12,000 Albanians who arrived in small boats have been deported this year, is this proof that Britain needs to take a more heavy-handed approach? And is the Home Office right to consider housing migrants on cruise ships? We'll debate at 10 p.m. After two years in exile for stating biological fact, Father Ted creator and cancelled comedy legend Graham Linehan throws down the gauntlet to Elon Musk overturn my permanent Twitter ban to prove you're serious about free speech. He's going to join me live in the studio at 10.20. Another week and there's more bombshells facing our royal exiles. After his accuser drops a separate lawsuit against another high-profile figure admitting she may have been mistaken, should Prince Andrew have argued his innocence in court? And is Meghan wrong to claim anyone calling her difficult secretly wants to call her the B word? My royal masterminds, Lady Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier weigh in on both those bombshells at 9.35. Are Labour too stuck in their woke ways to appeal to real Brits? Well, broadcaster, writer and blue Labour supporter Paul Embry believes so. He's tonight's outsider at 9.50 as TV farmer Gareth Wynne-Jones warns the war on meat will see us sleepwalk into food shortages. Should we keep eating meat out of principle to send a message to eco-extremists? Well, I say yes, and tonight Gareth will be taking on Animal Rebellion live in the clash. I'll get your verdict too. That's at 9.20. Can we skip to the good part? We'll debate that and more in the media buzz at 10.30. Tomorrow's newspaper front pages and Greatest Britain, Union Jackass coming up too. This is Dan Wharton tonight. Let's go.
Thank you so much for being here. The news first, though, of course, as always on GB News. Here's Polly Middlehurst with the headlines. Dan, thank you and good evening to you. Our top story on GB News tonight. The Prime Minister is saying nurses' pay demands are clearly not affordable. His comments come after the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, said he'd had a constructive meeting with the Royal College of Nursing today. The union's been urging the government to increase nurses' salaries or face industrial action across the country. Rishi Sunak says talks will continue. Unions are asking for a 17% pay rise, and I think most people watching will recognise that clearly that's not affordable. And I, of course, recognise the challenges uh, people face. And the way that we resolve these situations is we have an independent body that makes recommendations to the government, and indeed the Health Secretary accepted those recommendations in full. Uh, and I'm pleased that he will be sitting down with the unions to see how we can resolve this. Well, that news comes as just over 7 million people in England now are reportedly waiting to start routine hospital treatment. That is a new record high. The latest data released by NHS England shows that over 400,000 patients have been waiting more than a year for health care. A&D waiting times have also reached their highest level since 2010. And one in five patients who had surgery cancelled had to wait longer than 28 days for a new appointment. Well, there's more strike action reported today. Teachers in Scotland announced their first strike date after voting overwhelmingly for industrial action. Members of the EIS union will walk out on the 24th of November after rejecting a 5% pay increase. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, says the Scottish Government is limited by its fixed budget. We operate within a fixed budget. That was one of the points I've just been making to the Prime Minister. Without additional resources from the UK government, there is a hard limit on what the Scottish government is able to do. Within that, we will continue to talk to trade unions and we will continue to uh, do everything we can to give public sector workers the best possible pay deals. And lastly, the England manager, Gareth Southgate, has named his 26-man squad for the World Cup in Qatar, which kicks off in just over a week's time. The FA made the announcement on the England Twitter feed today. So, Leicester midfielder James Madison has been included in the squad, as has Newcastle's Callum Wilson and Man United's Marcus Rashford. Former Tottenham, West Ham and Portsmouth manager Harry Redknapp told GB News, it'll take more, though, than skill to win the tournament. And a great drawing in the last World Cup. We got to the semi-final without really playing a decent team. And then we could get beat by Croatia. If the draw is in our favour, we can miss the Argentina or Brazil or whoever. There's no reason we can't go very, very close again. I think we've got a big chance. You're up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. You're with GB News. Let's get back to Dan Wooden tonight. How many more days uh, do we have to put up with the eco-terrorists of the culture stop oil blocking the M25 and risking death and injury to ordinary folk? Well, it happened again this morning for the fourth day in a row. There were multiple incidents of roads being shut as the group scale gantries, providing more proof that our woke police and weak justice system don't have the stomach to stop these criminal lunatics. I'm here, obviously, because I feel the need to. Why else would I be here? I wish I didn't have to do this. I'm so relieved I've put the banners up without causing an accident. I was really worried about distracting drivers. It's an immense worry, but what else can we do to raise the alarm? We're in big trouble. We need to stop oil. The heist team have arrived to try and get me down. They think they're getting me down to safety. But it's just as dangerous down there as it is up here until we stop new oil and gas. Stop Oil have now staged a 32-day campaign of terror from the end of September throughout October, now into November. Uh, of course, the human toll of this criminality has already been significant for hard-working Brits, first, uh, forced to lose work, uh, miss cancer appointments, or in the tragic case uh, of one poor man, Tony Bambury, 
traumatically lose the opportunity to be the pallbearer at the funeral of his own father. I was actually due to be a pallbearer on my father's coffin along with my son. And we both got that taken away from us. There was a sense of how dare they put someone that I don't know has taken that ability for me to say farewell to my father away from me and I will never ever forgive these people for what they have done to me. Nor should you. But the common crims of Just Stop Oil simply don't give a damn. Because that's what happens when you're a member of a doomsday cult so brainwashed by propaganda that you lose your humanity, compassion and brain. That was obvious for all to see on our sofa last night as two Just Stop Oil spokespeople made it clear they don't care if Brits die as a result of their criminal campaign of terror, even though the facts show the UK is leading the world in reducing carbon emissions, with China being the real problem. Hold up your hands for me. Can I have a look at your hands? You must have washed them because I'm surprised there's not the blood still on your hands. What we need to do, when man... Go, you, need to get, go. you need to get off the roads and let people get on with their lives. That's what you've got to do, mate. You've got to calm down. When the government gives us what we will. Will, will. will you be happy when someone dies? Make a will you be happy? statement. No, will you be happy of when someone dies? Of course we won't be happy. Well, then, what are you doing? Do you think what you're doing now is the right way forward? No, yes or no? Yes or no? I do absolutely believe it's the right So you think what you're doing is right at the moment, yeah? Absolutely. At this point in history, in 2022... Do you know what? You will be on the wrong side of history because people are going to die. Well, time will tell, Dan. Time will tell. People are going to die and you will have that blood that I got you to search for on your hands. Now, luckily, Superwoman Suella Braverman is on the side of the public when it comes to Just Stop Oil and knows that the police are now part of the problem. In an important speech to the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners and National Police Chiefs Council, the Home Secretary conceded the police had, quote, lost confidence in themselves and were suffering from an institutional reluctance to tackle disruptive groups like Just Stop Oil, which were now, in her words, out of control. Sadly, in recent months and years, we have seen an erosion of confidence in the police to take action against the radicals, against the roadblockers, against the vandals and the militants and the extremists. But we've also seen the police appear to lose confidence in themselves. This has to change. Criminal damage, obstructing the highway, public nuisance, none of it should be humoured. Scenes of members of the public taking the law into their own hands are a sign of a loss of confidence. And I urge you all to step up to your public duties in policing protests. The Home Secretary is right to say that too often the rights of criminal activists are being placed above the rights of hard-working Brits, with their actions bringing misery and chaos to the law-abiding majority. Now, I think it's bringing a sense of lawlessness, actually, to our streets, and I fear that could one day be exploited by a more traditional terrorist organisation. Members of the North London Champagne Socialist chattering classes like the unleashed ex-BBC lefty Emily Maitlis might compare these criminals to the suffragettes and civil rights leaders of the past. One person's grandstanding is another person's civil rights action. I don't think Rosa Parks, I don't think anyone thinks Rosa Parks was grandstanding when she asked to sit down on a bus in Alabama. I don't think anyone would call Emily Davison grandstanding when she ran in front of a horse. And I think the only difference is the time. But Maitlis is wrong. The woke judges are wrong. And the soft-touch police are wrong. Just Stop Oil are on a dangerous criminal campaign putting our safety at risk. Appeasement has failed. And past sentences have clearly been far too short to deter this madness. Lock them up. To respond now, my superstar panel. The columnist and media personality, Carol McGiffin. Former Conservative London mayoral candidate, Sean Bailey. And the author and broadcaster, Amy Nicole. McGiff, the thing is, right, I absolutely believe in the fundamental right to protest. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the fundamental right for lawful civil disobedience. But this is not even close now. It is a criminal campaign of terror. 
Yeah, uh, and I think there is um, an even more sinister cult behind it all. Mm. Um, and uh, yep. I do think that these people... Um, I don't know, they seem to have just suddenly appeared from nowhere. There's lots of them doing really they're being damaging funded, aren't things. They? I, well, of course they're being funded, but nobody seems to be able to find out who's doing that. We're looking into it at and the moment. And why. Well, good. Uh, about time somebody did. What's that? They say on their website where they're funded. Well, there's a, there's well, a lot of which shadowy website? folk yeah. from uh, California who I think are pumping money into these guys. Yeah, I think that too, Dan. And I do think that, in a way, when Suella Braveman says uh, the police have lost confidence, mm. they know they have the power to stop these people and do something about it, but they're leaving the public to do that. It's funny, they didn't do that at the Freedom Marches. They stopped anybody yeah. in their tracks and literally dragged them off the street if they thought they weren't either wearing a mask or doing something wrong. Um, and I, I just... I wish it was just the fact that the police had lost confidence, but it is, it's, it's not that. It's nothing to do with that. It's almost as though um, it, it's, it's being done in a way to push people to a point where they will just accept any new law that will come through that says they want to ban... And it wouldn't surprise me at all if they said we want to ban protests altogether and there'll be a new Public Order Act or an addition to an act that's already in place that will do that. Yeah, and, and that's the danger of this, and I do I, understand yeah. that. But that's why I am so determined, actually, that these groups should be redefined as eco-terrorist organisations, because if you look at the 2000 Terrorist Act, that is what they are. And, and I think you're right, it's, it's a real risk yeah. uh, that actually the actions of this lot usher in more draconian... Uh, yeah, and people thoughts. will welcome it. They'll love it yeah. because they'll think, well, at least we won't get stuck on the M25 yeah. anymore. And they're allowing that... Yeah. This is why they're allowing it to happen. And all the other things that they've done, it's like they get yeah. so much publicity and they say they're doing it for the publicity, but they're not. Yeah. If people just ignored them, then no-one would care. But, Sean, we're at the end of our tether because this has been a four-day campaign this week. But today I looked back at uh, my digest for this show in early October last year, and exactly the same thing was going on. So nothing has changed, there's been no change in law enforcement, and the woke judges are actually, on the whole, a soft touch to these groups. You're completely right. But before I say that, I'm, I am offended that Emily Make This would compare this to oh. Rosa Parks. We're talking about the emancipation of nearly half the world's population and some jumped-up, mostly students mm -hmm. and ne'er-do-wells disrupting working people's lives. White, middle-class champagne socialists. I, I, I'm <laughs> glad you said that, because that, that's what it's beginning to look like. But the important thing here is the police and the judicial system. Often the police have to take the criticism for what's going on in courts. Yes, they are palpable in all this, but there's two things happening here. First, the courts have to do something about these people. We need to send a message that we have rules and you have to abide by those rules. And the other thing about the police as well, they didn't arrive here on their own. When you have politicians like Sadiq Khan welcoming XR as allies, when you have John McDonald saying that he, he wants to see more civil unrest, this is what happens. And I'd caution those two people to think carefully before they speak. But the most important thing here, if we do not get hold of these people, you'll start to see the public take their, the, the law into their own hands. Well, someone's going to die. Hey, look, someone's 100%. Gonna someone's gonna, but we've already seen people start to do this. Mm -hmm. But let's let's be clear here. Let's still support the police at the point, because at this point, the police don't want to be judged in the court of public opinion. That's what they're afraid of. But actually, if they don't act... It's too act, late for that, though, sure. I, I agree, but if they're they don't act... They're bottles of water and asking exactly, them if they they're want now, anything. They're now, they're now going to be judged. And they have been doing so for months. Yes. yes. But now they're going to be judged in, in a negative way because of how soft they are. The police need to yeah. maintain authority, and that means taking action. Amy Nicole, the, well, police, now, then. the police need to toughen up because this is criminal behaviour. We can't uh, have this. It is criminal behaviour, which is why most of these people end up in courts and a, a big chunk of them end up in prison. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they do. don't. They're but in I prison think... very briefly. I mean, if you look at the example of one of these people today, uh, vandalising artwork a couple of weeks ago, taken to court, out, and there they were this morning. But that artwork wasn't actually vandalised, was it? And I, I think that was actually a really good example of them attracting attention and not actually doing anything damaging. That got um, 50 million views, the video of that. But the, the picture, but the picture was behind enter, glass. You so... can't enter a, a, a space uh, and throw... A tomato soup all over it in a civilised society. But would you not prefer that than what's going on in the M25? Yes. Exactly. So I think, yeah, actually... I prefer, no, I I prefer neither of them. Exactly. Why not? Yeah. 
No, no, I don't wonder what happens. I wonder what happened if if I rolled into the National Gallery and throw paint. I bet I get dealt with very differently. It probably very depends. good boy. Yeah. Yeah. So if we very look good at... point. And I keep thinking that, Sean. Actually, I, I keep thinking. Just imagine How do they if, get if in? these were groups with different motives. The police would not have such a light touch. And I think the issue is. There's almost a conspiracy, isn't there, amongst the political establishment, the blob, the justice system, most politicians that are sympathetic. I think style. equally, though, you three should probably think about whether it's the issue or the method that you're disagreeing with, because if they were using these means to protest against something that you're really passionate about, so, say, when, when, the, lo when the lockdowns were going on... to break the law? C it's I not say, the Amy, point. Amy, it's, I think you draw issue question. with it because... That's a great question, but let me very, be very clear. <laughs> I'm about the means, about the means. I come from a community that has suffered hugely from crime of all different types. So I'm talking about the means of what they're doing and they're damaging their own message. There's many people now who will not hear the message because all I remember is my mother died, I couldn't get to the funeral yeah. or, or you kept me away from work. I remember the but first no one... set of XR protests. I bumped into a guy on the road. He was carrying his big um, mitre saw across the bridge. And he said to me, get these morons off the road, because if I don't work, I don't get paid and my children don't mm. eat. But That's what people concentrate on. It's not just about those stories, and, those, uh, and they are heartbreaking nonetheless. It's, it's more about, does their argument add up? And actually, no, it doesn't. It, it, uh, it doesn't. You can't just go around saying, let's stop That's oil. not what they're saying. No, they're saying, let's they stop are. new No, they're oil not. They're saying, let's they stop are. new exploration of now, oil. Though. And now, though. And that is actually... No, Amy, that's actually you something... you realise what that calling that, would lead for a lead to no, immediate it's actually, poverty and the lights it's would pretty, go out this winter? That's, that's, that, that's simply not true. It is true. No, it's not. This is literally taken off the Labour manifesto. This is a promise made by Labour. It's not that unreasonable. It's not that extreme. It's certainly not radical. <laughs> unreasonable for me. <laughs> yeah, Carol, that Carol that you wanted to come in. Well, <laughs> it's, it, that's the thing, right? You can't just suddenly say, right, let's just stop oil now, stop it. And I don't think... They're not saying that. No, they are saying They, they are. are saying They're that. saying, let's they are stop saying that. new oil licensing. And not stop originally, oil. yes, but they want to stop oil. When you hear them, like, you know, ranting and bleating on the top mm. of those bridges, they don't make any sense, no, Amy, if you wash. actually listen to them. They don't make sense and they want to stop all oil, they want to stop the cars, they want to stop absolutely everything. And, and, and they the, literally you've, do in, you've interviewed quite a few of them <laughs> and none of them make sense. None of them no. can... They have no argument and they can't and actually they stand up. And they don't know the facts. No, they don't. Which is that we have done more than any other G7 nation. We are doing more. My personal opinion, and I think you agree with it, Carol, is that we are going way too fast, Yeah, actually. but that's an opinion isn't it? And a, and a counter opinion would be we're not doing enough, there's not enough action and that's a very oh, commonly held a very commonly driving, held opinion. Stop eating your beef carpaccio, <laughs> stop flying anywhere because that is what these it's, folks... It's, it's, it's totally not. It's, 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 you're totally it's, misrepresenting. I'm not, they want you know what was really disruptive? If you talk about disruptiveness, disruptiveness this week, what was more disruptive? What happened this week? A traffic jam. That's all it is. Mm. Or the oh. summer when... Oh. So many people died because of the extreme heat. If you can't say How now... How many people died because of the extreme heat? Find me the... Give oh, me the proof. Amy, a lot more Amy, Give me the proof. Amy. Give me the proof well, that anyone in the UK died I think there were. I think there were heat. 40 excess deaths, which is a lot more than what's happened in this traffic jam that you're also... Oh, let's talk about excess deaths. Yes. <laughs> but it's not... But, but what? Hang on. But, but the, the key thing, the key, the key thing here, firstly, let's talk about the one big important fact. We are less than 1% of yeah, the world's yeah, yeah. emissions, yeah. but yet we're yeah. leading the charge in reducing those emissions. Who buys they don't, they most don't, yeah. of the things? There's a brilliant animation, animation on Twitter, I don't know if you saw it, about how it started when the Industrial Revolution mm. was going and how it, uh, yeah. Britain was like yeah. quite high up with the, the emissions and it's gone right down well, we to nothing. Mm. And but, China's but, right at the well, top the, now. And who's buying all the things China? What to do. No, and they're not even taking part. And China has uh, put out more CO2 emissions in the past eight years than we have since the start of the Industrial Revolution. So uh, these goons don't have a clue what no. they're talking about. We need to find out who they're funded by, what their real motivation is. But I think the bigger point is if the police don't clean this up, unfortunately, what Carol's saying could be true, that we lead towards more draconian laws, mm. which could actually be very worrying for free well, speech. Well, just give them a meaningful response like they're asking. No, the meaningful response is no, you're losers, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And go away. And go away and stop breaking I, I the mean, law and go to school, get a haircut. The, 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 the police aren't going to stop this happening. What is the meaningful response that they want? They want a meaningful response about no further oil yeah. licensing. They, they don't want a meaningful response. And that's actually they, they fair are, enough. They, they are that's actually... They, they are an... They are an terror group 
threatening the government. If this was any other form of organisation saying we are going to completely subvert democracy and we are going to cause serious crimes and put people's lives at risk, unless you do what we say now, you would be outraged. Imagine if that was an Islamic terrorist group doing that. Imagine if that was a fundamentalist religious group doing that. But because no. they're green extremists, you think it's OK and it's not OK. You look, Amy Nicole, look Sean Bailey, Cal McGiffin, my it. superstar panel will be here all night. But coming up, as debate rages over whether Prince Andrew should have gone to court and Meghan claims uh, we all want to call her the B word, my royal masterminds, Eddie Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier, break down two bombshells facing the royal exiles. But first, as Britain's favourite farmer, Gareth Wynne-Jones, warns the war on meat will see us sleepwalk into food shortages. Should we keep eating meat out of principle to send a message to eco-extremists? Well, the man himself goes head-to-head -head with animal rebellion in The Clash next. I'd love to know what you think. Email me, dan at gbnews.uk. Tweet me using the handle at TV News. Our poll running there too. The results in the clash straight after the break. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12 on TV, on radio and online. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment, or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> <laughs> whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. And it's time now for The Clash. 
Now, while eco-extremists continue to wage a war on meat, one no-nonsense farmer has revealed the stark reality of their delirious dream world. Gareth Wynne-Jones, star of the BBC's The Family Farm, has warned the push to go plant-based will harm livestock farmers whose land has little or no agricultural value, which in turn could lead to food shortages in mere months. He claimed scared farmers are already producing less due to the increasingly cutthroat standards of supermarkets, who are instead, quote, trying to cash in on people's belief that they they will save the planet by eating fake meat. Uh, this is what he had to say on the Daily Telegraph podcast, Planet Normal. We're looking at these massive corporations now with their oat milks and their soya milks and whatever, yeah, and this is saving the planet. Environmentalists say we need to stop all livestock production. Now, these are things that are going to make people hungry. And I am telling you now, this is a fact. This world is sleepwalking into food shortages if we're not careful. So should we as a nation keep eating meat out of principle to support our farmers and send a message to these ecos? Alex, well obviously I want to hear your thoughts on this. Dan at gbnews.uk at gbnews. Our Twitter poll is running but duking it out now the figures at the heart of this story. It's the man himself, Britain's favourite farmer Gareth Wynne-Jones and a spokesperson for Animal Rebellion Nathan McGovern. So, Gareth, look, it seemed to me like you were making very reasonable points. Uh, and it's not like you are against uh, these vegan activists. But, in fact, we have to keep eating meat, don't we? Yeah, well, it's a good way of getting protein into your body. It's very healthy, nutritious. My family's been on this farm, you know, farming this land 375 years and it's a sustainable, environmentally friendly way of producing protein from marginal land. Let's not forget, a lot of the UK is marginal. We have a great temperate climate, which grows grass and different flora and fauna, where the sheep and the cattle can graze, and we can eat them. And we do get a few byproducts, as in leather, and we do get wool as well. So it, it's a win-win. And... Um, you know, I, I, I'm never, ever going to tell anybody else what to eat. It's a personal choice. Mm. But when people start misleading other people with propaganda to say that their diet is going to save the planet, well, that is totally untrue. Nathan, uh, you need to respond to that, don't you? Because I actually agree with Gareth. You're spouting propaganda here. Um, well, first of all, um, I would actually like to say, I think... All of us here agree on a lot more than we disagree on. Um, okay. Just before, in that, that Telegraph clip, um, Gareth, I heard you speak about farmers being undervalued. That, that is a fact, absolutely. You know, we have a government that, you know, is cutting subsidies left, right and centre for farmers, you know, going and pursuing free trade at all costs. You know, you've even talked about yourself, the, the dangers of relying on global food markets when we have massive... Don't you want to stop all livestock, fa livestock farming? What Animal Rebellion is calling for is a just transition to a plant-based food system. And but no it, meat whatsoever. It's about working with farmers to achieve that. And it's about understanding that farmers are the people who are at the front lines of this. You know, farmers are what, the ones... What about, the, what about the, the members of the public who, like me, who are going to keep eating meat till the day that I die? Dan, I think there's something very important to understand about the food system we have, you know... As I've already said, it's exploiting farmers no end, but it's also exploiting the planet and it's hugely inefficient. And I'm sure, you know, both of you can agree with me on, you know, this principle of we should have an efficient food system. You know, about 83% of global farmland um, is used for, for animal products. Uh, that produces only 37% of But Gareth, our I was listening to what you were saying earlier, Gareth, that actually our calories. You, you say that... Uh, Farming meat is actually, in many cases, far more efficient and environmentally friendly than a plant-based food system. Yeah, the problem Nathan doesn't understand is the soil fertility, and without ruminants, we won't have soil fertility. You can only keep planting something in the ground. Um, can I just ask you, Nathan, how much food uh, do you grow yourself? How much um, stuff do you plant? And, um, you know, the percentage of the food that you're growing, are you eating? Uh, yeah, great question, Gareth. Well, you know, actually at home, I compost as far as I can to plant, you know, in our, you know, small outside area where I live. I plant as much as I can to grow food for myself. 
you know, because I understand the value of that. And actually, I, I see the joy that I experience in seeing, you know, what we have planted actually growing. Well, but what about that, the joy that I experience eating a steak? How, how, where do you get off telling me what I choose to eat? And that's what I think you need to be honest about here, Nathan, because not only are you telling all farmers to ditch livestock farming altogether, you're actually telling all Brits to stop eating meat altogether, aren't you? You want all of us to turn into unhealthy vegans, fainting all the time, breaking our hips all the time. <laughs> well, I don't think I really embody that uh, emaciated vegan stereotype you might well, no, have but in you, your head. You'll break a hip probably later in life. I don't know if you saw the research earlier this year, but vegans have a far, far higher chance of uh, breaking their hips. Well, Dan, just to talk about that study, that's, that's one study amongst many. Um, and it's actually not a research about, about the male biology. It was a research about the female biology. So that might not well, apply to Well, I me, think male so... vegans are very unhealthy too. <laughs> we, need, we, well, need, we need meat can and we I need just, plants. Can yes, I, please come can in. I just jump in. Can I just jump in as well? Because I think what we need to be looking at is seasonal. We need to be looking at regenerative. You know, th this milk I'm drinking here has travelled about five miles. This has come mm. from a grass-fed farm, my friend. It's in a glass bottle. You know, this is not your oat milk or your so soya milk or your, your rubbish that's flown from all over the world, the almond milks. We've got to be sustainable. We need food security in this country. But, Nathan, you have Nathan, a problem with that bottle of milk, don't you? You actually would rather have one of these bizarre uh, soya milk that has come from the other side of the planet. How, how do you, how do you rationalise that? Uh, well, I think it's very important to look at the facts. You know, you both talk about peer-reviewed evidence, whether it's here or elsewhere. Um, you know, one such study comes from the University of Oxford in 2018, the most comprehensive review of food production in history. I'm sure Gareth is going to disagree with me on that. I can see him shaking his head. But it remains a massive, massive analysis that rings true on so many accounts when we talk about the efficiency of our food system here. You know, the fact of the matter is that producing dairy milk use multitudes times more land, more water, whilst also producing more emissions. Oh, he's gone. We've lost him. Uh, Nathan, uh, let me ask you, how on earth do you think the British people are going to accept giving up the thing that many of us love more than anything in the world? We want to have a great roast beef on a Sunday. We don't want to have a nut roast. I mean... You're trying to control our lives. Where do you get off? Well, the, the people trying to control our lives are, are at the Home Office and in Parliament right now. They're the ones that are artificially manufacturing low prices in supermarkets. You know, if you look... No, but just be honest about your agenda, because you look, I'm, I'm talking about people who are sitting at home and want to know about the Animal Rebellion agenda. You are telling us very soon we're not going to be able to eat any meat, aren't you, whatsoever. That's what you want. That's what you want us to do. Well, what I would love to see is to have a government step up with a bold and decisive politics and support farmers who have been in a cost of living crisis for years longer than the rest of us. OK, I, I think we've them. got Gareth back, so I'm just going to give Gareth the final word. Gareth, I thought, I thought you might have stormed off there. Ah, no, I was having a sup of milk. Um, <laughs> I've got some rabbit problems. We've gone out shooting rabbits now uh, just to watch after my veg. But let's have a farming Don't tell food Nathan revolution that. in this country. Let's get people behind British agriculture yep. any which way we can. Yes. And I'm sorry, really nice to meet you, Nathan, but I totally disagree with your animal rebellion. Well, I'd and, love to you continue know, this conversation. Vegan diet, yeah. And I hope your health holds out. Yechi Da from Wales, living the dream. Thank you so much to Britain's favourite farmer, Gareth Wynne-Jones, and the spokesperson for Animal Rebellion, Nathan McGovern. So who do you agree with? Should we keep eating meat out of principle? Uh, to send a message to eco-extremists like the Animal Rebellion. Well, Susan on Twitter says, I only eat meat once or twice a week, but I feel like eating more just to upset these dreadful people. Uh, Sean says, why should these eco-zalots tell us what we should eat? They are fascists. If I want to eat meat, it's my choice. It's a free country. And from Elliot, how about we eat meat if we want to, don't eat meat if we don't want to, and respect each other's choices? And your verdict is now in. 92% of you agree that we should keep eating meat out of principle against eco-extremists. Just 8% of you wanting to go vegan.
Now coming up, is Labour just too woke to govern? Broadcaster, writer and blue Labour supporter Paul Embry believes so. He's tonight's outsider at 9.50. But first, should Prince Andrew have argued his innocence in court? And is Meghan wrong to claim anyone calling her difficult secretly wants to call her the B-word? Well, I can't wait for this. Our royal masterminds, Lady C and Phil Dampier, are live with me straight after the break. We are GB News, and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice. We are here for you on radio, television, and online across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30 a.m. every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great good happening. Let him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for The Briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the people's channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the people's news channel. Welcome back. Now, 48 hours ago, Virginia Dufre, the woman who accused Prince Andrew of sexual assault, sensationally withdrew a separate allegation she made about the high-profile lawyer, Alan Dershowitz. Dufre, you all know, an alleged victim of the Jeffrey Epstein sex trafficking ring, and earlier this year, she agreed a settlement with Andrew for a reported $12 million, equivalent of £10 million. Andrew made no admission of guilt and has always denied the claims levelled at him. Dufre also claimed that Epstein had forced her to have sex with the one-time Trump attorney Dershowitz. However, now she says she, quote, may have made a mistake. In the wake of that bombshell, sources close to Dershowitz have branded the Duke of York a fool for not taking Dufrey to court and clearing his name. And I'm joined now by our esteemed royal masterminds, Lady Colin Campbell and Phil Dampier. And 
Lady C, I have to come to you first on this because you have been one of the most high profile proponents and defenders of Prince Andrew. You have always questioned uh, some of the, how should we put it, Lady C, uh, credibility around Dufresne's claims. How do you feel about this U-turn from her over, over Dershowitz? Well, I have always said that I knew that she would have to settle against uh, Mr Dershowitz because if she didn't settle, she was going to have to end up going to prison for perjury. So if you knew what was going on behind the scenes, it was a no-brainer that she'd settle. Uh, she, the woman is totally... Uh, She's a total liar. She, she, she has invented all sorts of things. It's a matter of black and white record that she didn't even know who, who Mr. Dershowitz was. And it was suggested to her by a Mail on Sunday journalist that she name him. You know, it's all there in black and white. And she came up with all of these phantasmagoric memories that she had. But of course, because Dershowitz is a very powerful person in the United States, not only legally, but in terms of his political connections, it was always a done deal that at some point it was going to have to be a done deal. And that, that he would, that that they would settle the case in such a way that there would be as little egg on her face as possible. But you know. So, do you think Andrew made a mistake money. to settle given this? Sorry? Do you think Andrew made a mistake to settle given what's happened this week? Well, you know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, but the fact yeah. of the matter is I have said all along that mm -hmm. I knew that Prince Andrew had to settle because if he didn't settle, he knew his mother was dying, and I tried to hint at it uh, all along, and I knew she was dying, he knew she was dying, and he knew that if the case had gone to court, which it would have gone this October, that it would have overshadowed the whole of her jubilee celebrations and would have ruined them. And he didn't want this. So he, as, so, as soon as th at the moment arrived when it became apparent that the photograph was a fraud uh, and people who use their minds would have figured out that if the photograph was a fraud, the whole thing was a setup, he used that to settle. He fell on his sword for his mother. You know, I don't understand why people think just because the man is not an attractive personality and that he's a prince, that he should have no justice. No. No, um, Phil, just to put uh, the other side, of course, sources close to Dufre say the Prince Andrew case is different. Uh, they say it's because he's so famous that she couldn't have mistaken his identity and also that there was that photo and the corroborating witnesses supporting her allegation. And I guess, Phil, Andrew, if he had wanted to clear his name, he needed to go to court. Although, as Lady C says, he did it for the good of his mother. It's a tough one, isn't it, Phil? Yeah, good evening, Dan. I mean, I'm no great fan of Virginia Jeffrey, and I think the fact that she's now admitted that she might have got this wrong about Alan Dershowitz uh, speaks volumes. But I do think that the uh, the Andrew case is different. Uh, I mean, why would you settle with somebody who you've never met? I mean, I don't believe that he never met her. I don't believe that that photograph is a fake with uh, his arm round her at uh, Ghislaine Maxwell's London flat. It's been checked out by the FBI. I do think Lady C's right that he didn't want the embarrassment of a court case uh, which would have been dreadful for the Queen, and I'm sure that uh, the stress of it all had took its toll on her. Mm. Uh, but having said all that, uh, and by the way, I, I'm actually told that he didn't actually pay off $12 million. I think it was oh, much okay. less, than, much nearer to 3 or $4 million, is what I'm told by some very good sources. But having said all that, I think he had to pay her off to spare the embarrassment. But I don't think you'd do that to someone you've never met uh, and uh, didn't have a relationship with. So as I say, I think the whole thing's very, very sad, very okay. sordid. Uh, but I think I think uh, he had to pay her off. Let's move on to the other royal exile, uh, Meghan, uh, who this week uh, is griping in her podcast about the word difficult. Listen to this. In other words, I think what Robin's getting at and what these people are implying when they use that very charged word. 
is that this woman, oh, she's difficult. Which is really just a euphemism or (laughs) probably not even a euphemism. It's really a code word for the B word. Oh, Lady C, your response. Well, my dear, let me put it this way. Uh, Megan is not the only high profile woman on earth who has a rep, who, who's, who is strong willed and stands up for what she believes in. You're looking at one of them. <laughs> you know, some people might say I'm awkward or difficult to deal with. Very few people say I'm a bitch. Megan, people say she's a bitch because she's a bitch. They also say she's difficult because she's difficult. You know, she's pushy. She is uh, tasteless. She is every, she, she seems to have created these podcasts as a platform to deny everything, every every failing that she has that the world knows about. I mean, if the woman wants to deny her failings, change her demeanor, you know, and between now and then, stop boring us with all sorts of self-serving rubbish. She is both difficult and a bitch. I mean, who, who could be not a bitch? the way she behaved to Prince Philip and the Queen when they were dying. It was horrific. It was utterly horrific. And Phil Damper, I mean, the irony in all of this is she's so worried about the D word and the B word. Well, shouldn't she actually be worried about virtually every senior staff member who worked with her during her time in the royal family actually using a very different B word, bully, and also calling her a narcissistic delusionist? I mean, surely that's more worrying, Phil. You've taken the word right out of my mouth. Take the words right out of my mouth, John. I was going to say the same thing. You know, the B word means bully, doesn't it? I'm I'm sure a lot of those people who allegedly were bullied by her at the palace have got all sorts of names for her we don't uh, hear about, and we heard about it all through Valentine Lowe's book as well. Uh, So I think they've got some some names behind her back. But uh, how many more of these podcasts are there to go? I mean, I'm not sure we can stand more, can we? It really is becoming one long whinge, isn't it? It really is. It really is. I mean, Lady C, I just want no more. But what I'm sort of loving about this, Lady C, is actually even her fans are now tiring of this. Well, yes, of course they are. You know, because, I mean, the woman has nothing to contribute except, please look at me, please pay attention to me, I'm a victim. What's she a victim of? She's one of the most privileged people on earth. She was welcomed by the British royal family. According to Harry, she had the family she never had. They welcomed her with open arms, according to her. Listen to what she said initially. And now she's on a bitch fest about how how unhappy she is and how disadvantaged she was and what a victim she was. I mean, the woman is just tiresome. You know, she needs to come up with a new act. Preferably one that we can actually say, oh, well, we like something about her. At the moment, she's dishing up dirt that means we can't like her. No, very good point. And and she can't say we didn't like her because we did. Thank you so much. Our royal masterminds on fire as ever, Lady Colin Campbell and Phil Dampy will speak very soon. But coming up, following reports that just 710 of the 12,000 Albanians who arrived in small boats have been deported this year, is the Home Office right to consider housing migrants on cruise ships? Put that to my superstar panel in the media buzz after 10. But first, a Labour too stuck in their woke ways to appeal to real Brits. Broadcaster, writer and blue Labour supporter Paul Embry thinks so. He's tonight's outsider straight after the break. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. 
And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubry, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes & Co. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club. Oh, my goodness me. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. On The Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with The Mark Stein Show. Hello, I'm Esther Akvey. And I'm Philip Davis. Whether you're watching or listening on TV, online or on radio, we handpick the latest stories, debates and expert opinions for your weekend. So whether that's politics, news or showbiz, we've got it covered. Join us every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock on GB News. Hello, I'm Alastair Stewart and I'd invite you to join me at noon on Saturdays and Sundays for Alastair Stewart and Friends. I've been in this business for over 40 years. Now, here at GB News, I've never been happier. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me noon on Saturdays and Sundays. I'm Mark Dolan. Join me at 11 on GB News for Headliners, in which I'll be joined by two of the UK's top comedians discussing tomorrow's papers. If it's an important story, we'll cover it, but we'll have some fun along the way. Headliners, the late night paper review that won't send you to sleep like the others will. Seven nights a week at 11 p.m. on GB News. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. Paul Embry is tonight's outsider. From taking the knee to failing to answer simple biology, Labour has proudly shown off their woke credentials in recent years. Here's a reminder. Emily Thornbury can, to that question, can a woman have a penis? And yes, therefore some of them will have penises. The people putting their hands up do not reflect the diversity of the people in this hall. There are too many white men putting their hands up. <laughs> Is it transphobic to say only women have a cervix? Well, it is uh, something that uh, shouldn't be said. It is not right. Despite a huge lead in the polls, nauseating moments like those are precisely why my next guest, a blue Labour supporter and trade unionist, plus a GB News presenter too, believes the party is too obsessed with political Correctness. So, Paul Embry, you think uh, this whole woke direction that Labour has gone and actually could be the best hope for the Tories to stay in power at the next election? Well, I was just cringing, Dan, when I was looking at some of those, uh, some of that footage that you were showing. I've actually sat at a Labour Party conference myself as a delegate uh, and heard the chair of the conference. Um, say that uh, he wasn't going to assume the delegate's gender. So he wasn't going to call the man sitting over there or the woman sitting over there. Um, and nobody, uh, nobody challenged that. Um, and I think that's really an indication 
of, yeah. of where the Labour yeah. Party is. And I've, I've been a member of the Labour Party for nearly 30 years, and I've watched this transformation and this embrace of the, the woke agenda and how, as a result, the Labour Party has lost the support of millions of working class people, has lost red wall constituencies, got annihilated at the last election because of the fact that people saw it as being woke and out of touch with their priorities and their beliefs. Um, and I'm not convinced, Dan, to be honest, that large parts of the party get it. I think some do. I think to a certain degree, Starmer does. Um, but there's large parts of the party, and I see it, that are still in the thrall of this woke agenda. And unless they ditch it, they're not going to win power again, no matter what the polls say at the moment, as far as I'm concerned. Really? That's fascinating. Yeah. But, but, but you look at Starmer, though, and I, I, I sort of agree, he, he's, he's not as far as a lot of uh, the Labour Party, but he still wasn't prepared to say that a uh, woman can't have a penis. No, and that's crazy, frankly. And, you know, the truth is, when you speak to ordinary Britons, the man on the Clapham omnibus, as, as people call it, um, they also think it's crazy. They also think it's insane that people think that a woman can have a penis, that a man can have a cervix. This is the type of view that is peddled by a tiny minority of people. But the reality is that people in the upper echelons of public life, particularly on the left, particularly in the Labour Party, are petrified of expressing the normal common sense view because they, they think they're going to be called nasty names on Twitter and they think they're going to be called a bigger. Well, you know, if you're going to deny scientific reality, then you are going to pay a heavy uh, electoral price for it. And I'm, you know, I'm not suggesting that we should have a society that does bully people or that does uh, treat people unfavourably because of who they are, because of what they wear, because of what they call themselves. But at the same time, you've got to have beliefs that are rooted in common sense and rooted in reality. And if you take these far out views, yet at the same time, hope that you can govern the country, you're not going to succeed because the majority of moderate mainstream voters are going to say, sorry, this is just crackpot stuff. You're not on my wavelength. I don't think I can trust you with government if you believe in that sort of nonsense. Fascinating analysis from Paul Embry, host of the political correction. It does make me think, actually. The Tories really need to hone in on these woke issues if they want to have any chance at the next election. Paul, thank you so much. It's 10pm, I'm Dan Woodson. Tonight, following reports that just 710 Albanians were deported out of the staggering 12,000 that arrived on small boats this year, is less talk and more tough action needed to solve the illegal migrant crisis? And is the Home Office right to consider housing migrants on cruise ships? That's our big debate with my superstar panel next. Tonight, I'm joined by Carol McGiffin, Sean Bailey and Amy Nicole. After two years in entertainment exile, simply for stating facts about biology, legendary Father Ted, creator and defender of women's rights, Graham Linehan, is throwing down an almighty gauntlet to Elon Musk. If you're serious about free speech, then get me back on Twitter. Linehan, live in the studio at 10.20. High taxes, a screeching new turn over COP27, and now Richie Sunak is being urged to look at the globalist policy of universal basic income. So are the world's elites trying to drag us into socialism? And the results are in. The winner of Miss Great Dairy is a uh, biological male. Can we skip to the good part? We'll discuss if the world's gone truly mad at our media buzz at 10.30. Plus, ahead of his internet-breaking new tour... Hey, look, it's Peter, OK? Hey, garlic bread! Hey, it's the future, lads! Hey, when are you back on tour? Next month. Peter Kay says cancel culture is out of control, but what's he going to do about it? Well, former Coronation Street actor and voice of the people, Charlie Lawson, is certainly doing his bit as he takes on the woke week in Uncancelled at 10.45. You'll also get a first look at tomorrow's newspapers as they drop. And as ever, brand new Greatest Britain Union Jackass last of the week. So do stay up with us tonight. But first, the news with Polly Middlehurst.
Dan, thank you. Good evening. The top story on GB News tonight. The Prime Minister says nurses' pay demands are clearly not affordable. His comments came after the Health Secretary, Steve Barclay, said he'd had a constructive meeting with the Royal College of Nursing. The union's been urging the government to increase nurses' salaries or face industrial action across the country. Rishi Sunak says talks will continue. Unions are asking for a 17% pay rise and I think most people watching will recognise that clearly that's not affordable and I of course recognise the challenges uh, people face and the way that we resolve these situations is we have an independent body that makes recommendations to the government and indeed the health secretary accepted those recommendations in full uh, and I'm pleased that he will be sitting down with the unions to see how we can resolve this. Well, that comes as it's reported that just over 7 million people in England are now waiting to start routine hospital treatment. That's a new record high for the UK. The latest data released by NHS England shows that over 400,000 patients have been waiting more than 12 months for health care. A&E waiting times have also reached their highest level since 2010. And one in five patients who've had surgery cancelled have had to wait longer than 28 days for a new appointment. And news of more strike action today. Teachers in Scotland announced their first strike date after voting overwhelmingly for industrial action. Members of the EIS union will walk out on the 24th of November after rejecting a 5% pay increase. Scotland's first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, said the Scottish government is limited by its fixed budget. We operate within a fixed budget. That was one of the points I've just been making to the Prime Minister. Without additional resources from the UK government, there is a hard limit on what the Scottish government is able to do. Within that, we will continue to talk to trade unions and we will continue to uh, do everything we can to give public sector workers the best possible pay deals. And lastly, the England manager Gareth Southgate has named his 26-man squad for the World Cup in Qatar, which kicks off in just over a week's time. The FA made the announcement on England's Twitter feed. So, List Leicester midfielder James Madison has been included in the squad, as has Newcastle's Callum Wilson and Man United's Marcus Rashford. Well, the former Tottenham, West Ham and Portsmouth manager Harry Redknapp told GB News earlier it'll take more than skill to win the tournament. We had a great drawing in the last World Cup. We got to the semi-final without really playing a decent team. And then we could get beat by Croatia. If the draw is in our favour, we can miss the Argentina or Brazil or whoever. There's no reason we can't go very, very close again. I think we've got a big chance. You are bang up to date on TV, online and DAB Plus Radio. This is GB News. Back to Dan Wooden tonight. Now it's time for tomorrow's news tonight in our Media Buzz. So the first front pages are in on the I, unions battle government in new winter of discontent. Uh, this as civil servants vote to join nurses, train drivers, postal workers and lecturers in strike action. Uh, the Metro leads on a story we're going to be talking about later in the show actually. David Williams apologising after he was revealed to have made X-rated slurs about contestants on Britain's Got Talent during the taping of the episode. The paper's headline, Be Little Britain. I will just make the point though. He was making these comments off camera uh, and someone has leaked them. And something typically offbeat from the Daily Star, Psycho Seagull kicked my head in. That's terrifying, isn't it? The story of an animal lover in West Sussex who was attacked by her bird best friend uh, while attempting to take a selfie. My superstar panel back with me now, the columnist and media personality Carol McGiffin, former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey and the author and broadcaster Amy Nicole. Now, this is so shocking. Do you know just 710 Albanians have been deported this year despite a staggering 12,000 invading Britain on small boats? According to the figures obtained by The Sun, one in four small boat arrivals this year has been from Albania as criminal gangs put our asylum system under intense strain. Now, Home Secretary Suala Braverman said last night she's exploring every avenue to finally solve the illegal migrant crisis, including possibly housing migrants on 
disused cruise ships or in university residence halls. It's hoped high volume sites will allow the Home Office to cut costs with the taxpayer currently forking out £6.8 million a day to house almost 50,000 migrants and asylum seekers in hotels. And I mean, look, Sean, these figures are just a disgrace, aren't they? Because the issue is Albanian human trafficking ga gangs now are completely empowered. They can use these figures to go and sell their service. Look, there's a number of things that needs to be looked at here. Firstly, this is an enormous sum of money. It's unsustainable. Somebody needs to do something about it. But a bit that really I think we need to focus on is the fact that these are criminal gangs. The number has risen so far because there's gangs across the world, not just Albania, maybe mainly Albania and only Albania, who are now smuggling people in because they can see what we're willing to pay to facilitate that. And the deeper thing that we need to look at as well, how do we help countries such as Albania and other countries mm. prevent people wanting to leave in the first place. And the last thing I'll say about Albania, let's make sure we don't make this into a, 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 an Albanian migrant crisis. It's a world mm. migrant crisis. So we need to look at it, how we're going to employ other agencies around the world. What to about these cruise people. ships? Do, do you like that idea? Uh, listen, as long as these places are humane and clean and safe, we may have to do that. And anybody, particularly if they're a Labour politician who says no, right, or somebody who's bringing a legal court case, they must answer where we will put them if it's not there and how much are they prepared to pay to keep this industry as it's becoming now going. Because, Carol, I mean, Maloney in, in Italy is, is saying, well, no, you, you stay on the ships uh, if, you're a, mm. if you're a bloke. If you're a young bloke, you're not actually going to set foot in Italy. Um... Yes, yeah, she is uh, saying all the right things. We we say the right things. Suella do. says the right things all the time. Every single Home Secretary has been saying the right mm. things. Priti Patel for years and years and years said the right things. Nothing has happened. And personally, I think that it's quite possible that the government is part of that cr criminal gang because it isn't doing anything about it. It's actively facilitating them bringing people into the country. They are, like Mark Stein said tonight, they don't have to get far off the coast before the RNLI or the Border Force go and pick them up and taxi them in. And, and the thing is, when you say, oh, only 700-odd um, Albanians have been deported back, since yeah. 12,000 and 12,000 have actually made it here, you, I think... That's a lot, actually, because normally when people get here, it doesn't matter where they're from or who they are or what they haven't done, they never no. have to go home. So, no. you know, and, and, and they actually... The vast majority stay. They do. And, they, and there was a, a guy on, um, uh, I think it was a Patrick Christie's show today as well, and he, he was saying, I think it was a human rights lawyer, and he said that the ships... The cruise ships are a pretty good idea because if they never reach the shore, then you can take them back to France. Yeah. And, and also, they shouldn't be allowed anywhere near even a ship or anything. If they don't have ID, they should have to be Absolutely. ID'd. But they do throw and, their ID into the sea. And that is how it sea. worked in Australia. Because, exactly. Because the thing is, it's about smashing the people smuggling gangs. And that is actually the humane thing to do, mm. Amy. And so surely you must agree with this because actually you don't want these folk even stepping foot in the UK if they are being uh, a victim of human trafficking gangs, because if they do, then it empowers the human trafficking gangs. I think this is all a result of the fact that we closed every, sealed off all the safe routes of asylum pretty much, and we're only... But we haven't We're only them all processing off. 4%. No, no, but just tell the truth. No, it's been illegal migration. But just tell the truth. We you... haven't sealed off how, all the how, how legal would routes, you though. Know? No, but we, no, but we haven't, hang on, Amy. Hang on, how can would... you just, No, but can you just tell no, the truth no, about that? Because look, we one, haven't... One question at a time. Well, no, because <laughs> I just have to pick you up, because you, you've told a, a blatant mistruth, because there are many, many forms of there legal no, routes to enter the UK no, there are fewer if and you're fewer an asylum and fewer seeker. And fewer forms. And actually, the number of people who want to come into the UK remains pretty much the same over the last 10 years. But the routes of getting here have changed as they've become sealed off. More people are crossing the channel. But actually, this is a crisis of the fact that 4% of claims are being processed. So how can you know who's trying to get in and who isn't and whether they're here rightfully, whether they're here wrongfully? How can you know the status of the people when you're only processing 4%? And when you talk about Australia, the thing that I find a little bit disturbing... You do realise it's because they, they did... get rid of all of their documentation. OK, but what is that? They get rid of all of their documentation because, unfortunately, they are 
on the whole, and I'm not saying all, but on the whole, they are economic migrants. But how is that the case? Because 86% were found to not be economic migrants and were found to have legitimate asylum Th that, claims. That it's can't be true. true if they're from Albania. If, 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 they're not... If, the majority hold on, hold on, hold on, hold okay, on. Hold well, on. If, they're, if they're from Albania, right, and other parts of the world, legally, the international community will tell you if they're asylum seekers or not. It's very important that we don't put economic migrants and asylum seekers so in the same So there part. were 12,000 people peoples. that came from Albania. There were also 12,000 people that came from Afghanistan. Remember Afghanistan when we all sat here and we said how absolutely awful it was that this situation had emerged and these people had to flee Yes, and there was a legal route to get from yeah. Afghanistan. No, yeah. how many people did we but take? 10,000? Something, absolutely pathetic, something absolutely pathetic. There's always a legal and route. Something absolutely pathetic. And now, those are the majority of the people crossing yes, but, the Amy, channel. They, they are the they laws. They could be us. They are the laws. That is, how, that is how the British people want. Now, I understand someone like you and I... It's great that you're honest about it. You would rather have an open borders policy. We throw open our arms to the world and we let I, everyone I come in. I, I think see... you should look around okay. our strained and stressed public services That's and not a see of that that would be an absolute disaster for this country. But, I look, I get it. So you want rather... open borders. But the fact is you must understand that even if they are coming from Afghanistan across the, what, across the channel, hmm. they are already in France, mm. a first-world country. France mm. already takes a lot more migrants than us, but they're also very known for being quite bad to migrants, and a lot of migrants don't speak. No, 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 they don't France. want to stay Come there on. because if, they don't Come get on. any Carol. benefits. They don't F actually France get... France is the first world country. If, Come on. Right, yeah. Come on. And the like, legal route is there. You so, can so apply if, for a visa, so you if can our pay country, for it, but you know that if, if they... They spend money on criminal gangs to get here because it's it's the only way they can get here. Because if they go through the legal route, they wouldn't qualify for a visa. They're probably they might not be educated. They might not have the qualifications that you have to. I think and you have to pay for a visa. It, that's the legal route. It's but, but, not but, shut it, down. It, it, I think I think it's really sad that you fail to see the potential in any of these people, and you'd rather have them stew on cruise ships in rooms for months at a time. Why do they rather than their contributing ideas? Why to do society? They Possibly their because they're totally terrified of what consequence that identification Amy, you're being may so have. Naive. Have you not Excuse seen me? the crime exploding I on our might... streets? Do you not understand that thousands of these people come with the specific aim of setting up prostitution rings and being part of drug dealing rings? That you is... shake your head. It is I didn't a shake fact. my head. It's not a Amy, fact. It is a it's fact. not a fact. It is a minority, and I'd rather be naive than completely cruel. No, but it's which not is cruel. What you is it... hold on, hold on, hold it's cruel to try and protect the British borders from criminal. Because they're not criminals. Hold on, hold on. They're people. Hold you on, could hold be on, in that Amy, situation Amy, Amy, one day, other... and when you are in that situation, you're probably going to want to go somewhere no, where they Amy, speak Amy, English. It's, it's simply, it isn't that stuck. It isn't that, that black and white. And the other thing is, you talked earlier about people from Afghanistan and other places that the world, international community, would recognise as, as proper refugees. Because our system has been overwhelmed with illegal yeah. That's migrants... Hold on, hold on. Not true. We're not able We've to not deal with people who are... We've not been swamped. Well, well, there is on, no record numbers hold of You're the one who just... No, numbers, hold on, we're still hold on, 19th per capita at Amy, taking migrants. You, most, just said, most... you just said that we only um, pro um, proceed with 4% of claims. Right. So I'd argue we are no. those. And what it means is, Amy, it means that people in the most dire need... No, it means people in the most dire need are not getting that asylum they need. And you have to accept 12,000 people from one country that is on nobody's international list for being watched because it's an unsafe place means there's something particular happening and needs to be dealt with. If those people are, are, are of great, great economic potential and great human potential, great, but they have to join our system because we won't be able to process them. That's Fine. And I one agree more with point, that. One so more what point. would be the same? Carol, Carol, make Just your point and then one more point. respond. Don't forget that there are people who have gone through the legal channels, they've spent fortunes, and I know some of them personally, they've gone through legal channels, they've spent an absolute fortune coming to this country, getting their visas, getting their citizenship mm -hmm. and everything else, and they have been turned back at the border. They've come in on a legitimate flight with a legitimate visa, and they have been turned back and sent back and then been billed for their fare to go back. Now, when that happens to people who come through the legal channels and have paid all that money to be here, and they see people just turning up and getting put up in, getting put up in a four-star hotel with all the bills paid, money given to them, phones, everything.
just just think how fair that is. It's not fair. Do you know fair, what? Amy. It's really funny. Final just, word, Amy. You're one of the people that hated lockdown so much. You completely were well, totally against it. You said so bad for mental health, blah, 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 blah. Well, it That's was. That's what you're doing. That's what's happening at the moment to the people no. across the channel. They are stuck in pretty much isolation with five pounds a week. And you wonder oh. why they oh. are frustrated and not behaving correctly all the time. It is it is literally stewing people. I didn't say they and this is what behaving. happens in Australia as well, in these detention situations. People are just suffering. Well, Amy, You're Amy, causing the most vulnerable Amy, people in the world. Most to of suffer them here more. in the UK at the moment are in four or five star hotels. Yeah. They get this three good meals no, a not. day. They're in Manston and getting diphtheria. And they're not, they're not the most Amy, vulnerable people. Amy, in the world. again, you're getting fireballs you're, Amy, because of rhetoric uh, like this. Amy, that's absolutely ridiculous. There are there was a brief overcrowding situation at Manston. The folk in Manston are only there for processing and then they are transported to largely four or five star hotels, which we But pay why for. would you it is resent unsustainable. that? People fleeing war and persecution, the most but no, you don't people in Albania. No, what do you know? And Albania is a NATO country. That These is... people are coming in to create crime in our country. And the fact that the you can't see that, look people. around the streets. Do you know how lawless this country is? And you're prepared for potentially you... tens of thousands of criminals to why enter this country. Why are you taking country? the minority to make the rule? Why are you doing that? What? It, it, look, look, listen, Amy. That's completely uh, Amy, Amy, the minority Amy, people that are I, I, abusing listen, the Amy, fact I'm with that we you. don't... I don't believe this, th th these people are all criminals. I don't even believe a, a big proportion of criminals. But what I do know, Amy, is they're not seeking asylum. What I do know... All... that they, they are, What I do know is they will give the government, the people of this country, an economic challenge that we can't answer right now. Well, look, and also... Sean, Sean, Sean I, I'm sorry. I absolutely agree with you. I think a large proportion of these people are not economic migrants and those people who are genuine asylum seekers, of course, yes. we need to look at them. But, but a huge number are criminals. Mm. They are Not coming huge, from Albania. Amy, I mean, it is. It's just it horrible. Is a huge... And also, every I, I have time, to every time I don't had... think I don't think it's a huge number of people who are making this trip of criminals. I, I don't think that. But I do believe it's a huge problem. I, I don't think we need to deal with it because they're criminals. I think we need to deal with it because of the numbers involved and the impact it will have on British people also, who were here. They're typically yeah. young and by the way, and you only, you only need profit. one terrorist to, to come in uh, on this sort of thing to cause huge No one's been tested. They've got no ID. No ID. We don't know who they are. Absolutely. Or where they go. And you know what? The reason we voted to Brexit was to, to control our borders, and that is not happening. Carol McGiffin, Sean Bailey, Amy Nicole, do stand by, because coming up, as Rishi Sunak is urged to look at yet another globalist policy of universal basic income, would free government cash be a good idea, or is this just outright socialism? My superstar panel are going to return to debate that in part two of the Media Buzz. We'll have more of uh, the newspaper front pages in by then, too. But first, after two years in exile, simply for stating biological fact, legendary father Ted creator and defender of women's rights, Graham Linehan, is throwing down an almighty gauntlet to Elon Musk. He's going to reveal exactly what that is live in the studio straight after the break. Hello there, it's Eamon Holmes here from Breakfast on GB News. We're not just on your television and your screens, you know. We're on DAB Plus Digital Radio, so you can listen to your favourite shows on the move. If you've not yet listened to GB News Radio, it's very simple. We're on your radio player and tune in apps. On your smart speaker, phone or tablet, or online at gbnews.uk. Take us with you wherever you go. GB News Radio. You never have to miss a moment of the People's Channel. Hello, I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm, where I'll be joined by two of the country's top comedians as we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it, I guarantee, but we'll also have some fun along the way. That's GB News Headliners at 11pm. We won't put you to sleep, unlike some of the other paper review shows out there. So join us, 11pm, seven nights a week. I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. 
Monday to Thursday on GB News, it's Bev Turner today from 10 a.m. There's never been a more interesting but also critical time in British politics. And I can't wait to bring you the biggest stories of the day with the best factual accuracy and also a few of my own opinions thrown in. We'll engage in passionate but always polite debate with your thoughts and opinions at the centre of it all. Monday to Thursday, 10 till 12, on TV, on radio and online. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deems & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Mark Stein. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio, and online, this is GB News. On the Mark Stein Show, we cover the stories a lot of people are scared even to mention. The stuff that really matters with some of the world's biggest thinkers. Now is his opportunity to kind of take the steering wheel of history. Break away from the flock at 8 o'clock on GB News with the Mark Stein Show. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Welcome back. Elon Musk's £40 billion Twitter takeover has put free speech back on the map. And my next guest is now making an impassioned appeal for his permanent ban on the site to be rescinded. So Father Ted, creator Graham Linehan, went from TV hero to cancelled comedy writer for daring to tweet, men aren't women, shock horror, in 2020 in response to a post about trans pride. The IT crowd creator was immediately given the boot for, quote, repeated violations of rules against so-called hateful conduct and hasn't been seen on the platform since. His intolerant critics were in raptures when the ban was dealt and they even commemorate the occasion on each yearly anniversary. So after two years in exile, Graham, one of the first and most infamous victims of cancel culture, is now throwing down the gauntlet to Elon Musk to overturn the ban and prove he is serious about free speech. And... Graham Linehan, great to see you again. Uh, to me, this is so clear-cut. If Elon Musk genuinely wants Twitter to become the public square and to be a free speech platform, you've got to be back on. Yeah, well, you know, um, I wouldn't say I was, I, was, I was involved in an impassioned plea to get back on. I'd, I'd be, it would be very nice to get back on. Uh, so because... you would return if given the opportunity. Sure, yeah, absolutely. My, my, my income now depends on my journalism. And uh, I used to have a, a reach of about... Uh, not, at, the, at its height, it was about 800,000, 900,000 people. Yeah. And even after I started talking about this, I lost 300,000. But that's still 500,000. Yeah. That's a lot of people. So, and do you want those followers back? Yeah. That's, but I don't, I'm not really interested in getting a new account and building it up again. Those, those followers were almost like a form of currency, you know. And when uh, Twitter unpersons someone, they kind of take away, you know, as I say, they, it's very much connected to my ability to make a living. Another uh, uh, journalist who was banned in Canada is uh, Megan Murphy, you know, and she's like a prominent Canadian feminist who was banned even before I was because she said that's him about a sex offender who identified as a, as a, as a woman. And all, and all you did, literally, was state biological realities, but you did it really at a time when maybe the trans debate hadn't quite crossed Not where over. it is, yeah. yeah. And J.K. Rowling wasn't... No, Public I was pre-rolling, yeah. yeah. No, she, it was... But also, I mean, the thing is, I wasn't doing... I wasn't breaking any of Twitter's rules. I was very careful not to... So mis how did they justify it, then? 
they, they didn't, they never told me exactly what I was banned for. They said it was for uh, misusing the platform, but they never said how. But there's they, been a campaign against you, hadn't there? Yeah, you? I was mass reported, you know, because, you know, people just, I mean, the, the, I was very annoying to people because I wouldn't abuse people and I wouldn't uh, uh, be hateful. I just didn't take any of the nonsense seriously. You know, and also I, I was early uh, on pointing out that mermaids were responsible for, you know, harming children. Well, yes, and I was going to say, do you feel vindicated when you see what's now being reported about uh, mermaids, when you see the fact that Hadley Friedman, who's left The Guardian, has revealed yes. that there's been a cover-up in the left-wing liberal media, which probably used to be the media that you would have relied on Absolutely, back in the day. Yeah. But there's been a real cover-up now to report that issue. And also when you see the fact that even the government has shut down the Tavistock Clinic. I mean, yeah. is there a vin feeling of vindication? Of course there is, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, and we're, we're, we're hearing reports that uh, there's going to be legal action taken against these um, doctors who facilitated these operations and these procedures. I mean, you know, it, it, it's sometimes too it's sometimes too big for people to get their heads around and they can't believe that it's been going on under their noses for so long. But it is, it's a scandal that's in plain sight. If you look at... Uh, yeah, so but they've chosen to ignore it. They? They've chosen to ignore it. The Guardian because has... It doesn't fit their woke agenda, it doesn't fit the... I know, but, but it's so shocking that someone like Kath Viner of The Guardian and, and you know, the various people at the BBC who've been, uh, who've been uh, covering this up, it's so shocking that they've done so when the stakes are so high. When you're talking about the health and safety of children, you know, when you're talking about um, placing a group of, of vulnerable children outside normal safeguarding procedures, then you have to make sure that you're telling the truth, you're not misleading your readers. If you are a Guardian reader, most Guardian readers, they don't know about the scandals at the Tavistock. They don't know about uh, know. the problems with mermaids. They don't know that mermaids had a, had a paedophile uh, as trustee, or a paedophile, excuse me, a, a man who wrote... Uh, let's say, paedophile adjacent uh, papers, uh, queer theory papers. Like, they, they, there's a whole section of society now who, that simply does not know what, what's no, going on. No, and Hadley Freeman in her resignation letter yes. uh, to The Guardian actually made the point that she had been directly banned yes. from writing on this scandal, which is a disgrace. And I think where the social media element is so important, Graham, is it's almost like... Uh, as we know, we've spoken about this before, but but the BBC and The Guardian, they were able to demonise you because they could say, oh, well, he's been banned from Twitter for yes. hateful conduct, so he must be a bad man and he must be telling mistruths. They used that ban, didn't they? Yeah, and, and the thing I'm actually more excited about, because they did this with, uh, I don't know if you know him, there's a, there's a Scottish nationalist blogger called Stuart Campbell who was mm. banned on the same day I was and just got back. Um, but... Uh, um, but Stuart, they said to, they actually wrote to Stuart and they said, we've looked into it and we've seen that you have not broken any of our guidelines. And I, I actually sent a uh, archive of all my tweets to Joanna Cherry's office and said to her, look, this is proof that I, I never abused anyone, never engaged in hate speech, never did anything like they're accusing me of. So basically what happened was a, a Silicon Valley company, which has a um, culture that's extremely, uh, extreme woke, you know, in terms of extreme boy, girl, women can have penises and, and lesbians can have penises and all these homophobic ideas um, has been able to influence uh, not just, um, you know, people who are online too much, like, like you know, the people on Twitter, but also governments and, and yeah. government institutions like the NHS yes, and yes, yes. schools. Well, that's their power, isn't it? So, so given... Twitter is under a new regime. Elon Musk has said free speech will be at the heart of what he does with Twitter. What would be your message to Elon Musk? What he needs to <laughs> I do don't that? like. Well, I'm not. You know, I don't know. My only, my only. The thing, the the good thing about Elon Musk, even though we really should trust none of these figures, mm. you know, it's a. But the good thing about it is. Unlike the previous owners of, of Twitter, who seem to kind of stumble upon it and never really understand it, um, Elon's, a, Elon's a fan of Twitter. He understands why it's good and why it's bad. He knows what, what, um, what he's got in a way that the old owners didn't. And uh, I think that's going to make for a, a better service all around, I'm hoping. 
Um, you know, and again, I'd like to see more conversations like the one you just had over there. A conversation like the one you just had, the panel you, you just had, is impossible on Twitter because people are terrified of expressing their ideas. They're terrified of uh, saying the wrong thing. Um, it's 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 dying as a free speech platform. So it is. Well, look, I think you're going to be a real fascinating case. You're a bit of a test case. Really, you should be back. And as you say, it would also be imperative that they reinstate your 500,000 followers because it's pointless if you have to try and, and build yeah. that back up, especially given, and again, I hope Musk stamps this out, but you know there's been all of the shadow banning and, and that sort of thing. Absolutely. So hopefully, Graham Linehan, writer of the IT crowd and Father Ted, will be back on Twitter soon. Time will tell. Graham, great to speak to you again. Thank you Thank so you, much. Thank you, but coming up after announcing his long-awaited comeback, uh, Peter Kay says cancel culture is out of control. So what's he going to do about it? Well, former Coronation Street actor and voice of the people, Charlie Lawson, he's certainly doing his bit. And he's uncancelled and breaking down that story, plus the week in Woke at 10.45. But first, as Rishi Sunak is urged to look at yet another globalist policy of universal basic income, would free government cash be a good idea or is it just outright socialism? And is it fair for a trans woman to be crowned the next Miss Greater Dairy? Those stories, more newspaper front pages and the return of my superstar panel in the media buzz straight after the break. We are GB News and we'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for bringing us your conversations, for helping our great nation find its voice we are here for you on radio, television and online across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. It's not the BBC, you know, you actually get your facts right. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Every Friday and Sunday night from nine, it's Mark Dolan tonight. We're on the same page again. Great, There's something great, great happening. Let him finish. Don't be such a cranky. <laughs> that mini budget was the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> and on Saturday, my show just got bigger. From eight, it's Mark Dolan's Saturday Night In. You can't govern a country if you can't speak. <laughs> Stop talking. My God, we reached the end. I've never been early in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Join me, Arlene Foster, for the briefing on GB News. Every Friday at 3 p.m., I'll give you all the latest political news and analysis, and we'll have a robust live debate. To make sure that you're caught up on all of the biggest issues of the day, we'll bring on experts in their field. I'll ask the questions that you'd like to ask. We're not afraid to tackle discussions from all perspectives, including yours. Don't forget the briefing with me, Arlene Foster, every Friday at 3 p.m. on GB News. 
We are GB News, right across the nation. You can get us on television, on radio, on digital. We're absolutely everywhere. Amazing! You see, amazing! You remind me of me in the European Parliament. <laughs> but here's the most important bit. We are not part of the mainstream establishment. We think and speak just like you do. We are the People's Channel. Magnificent. That's really, really thoughtful. Come and join us on GB News, the People's News Channel. Let's return to tomorrow's news site now in our media buzz. The front pages have been delivered. Let's get straight to them. The Daily Express warns it would be a tragedy if the care costs cap is delayed. They're quoting Sir Andrew Dill, not the architect of the government's social care cap, as the government moves to delay its implementation, which would help prevent pensioners from selling their homes to pay for care. The Guardian leads with calls for action as teachers reveal the scale of pupil hunger. Around 100,000 children in England are missing out on free meals because the income ceiling for eligibility has been frozen for four years while costs soar. That's according to analysis by the Lib Dems. Over the to the Times, and this is interesting actually, Kwasi Kwarteng claims he warned Liz Truss over radical reforms that led to the economy crashing as he breaks his silence following his sacking as Chancellor. He says he urged the former PM to slow down and take a methodical approach to growth. I guess, <coughs> by the way, I'm not blaming him, but that friendship's over, isn't it? <laughs> um, the Daily Mail criticises the police for failing to deal with Just Stop Oil protesters. Yes, absolutely. What is the point of the police as a lone protester forces the M25 to shut for the fourth day running and 17 officers stand around aimlessly more? Goodness me. I could not agree more, and of course, the subject of my digest at the top of the show. Uh, on the front of the Daily Telegraph, the US is reportedly urging Ukraine to use a window of opportunity for peace talks to end the war, as world leaders prepare for a showdown with Putin at next week's G20 summit. And The Sun leads with ITV halting the show First Time Mum after its star Fern McCann, a former Only Way as Essex cast member, ranted about the victim of her acid attacker ex, Arthur Collins, in leaked voice messages. She called Sophie Hall, who was left scarred for life after the attack outside a London club in 2017, ugly. Goodness me, it's, it's really disturbing, though, as well. I mean, terrible story, but it's also really disturbing how all of these messages keep being leaked, isn't it? Uh, David Williams and now Fern McCann, victims of it today. More on the media buzz uh, with tonight's superstar panel, columnist and media personality Carol McGiffin, the former Conservative London mayoral candidate Sean Bailey and the author and broadcaster Amy Nicol. Now, universal basic income. Have you heard about this? It is a policy straight from the globalist playbook. Some would argue it's next step to a sinister dystopian nightmare. So this is the premise if you haven't heard about it. It focuses on permanent free cash for citizens from the government, regardless of the individual's work status or attempts to find employment. So just like furlough payments during COVID, the idea of state-sponsored helicopter cash sounds great to begin with, but we all know that everything comes with a cost. So some critics fear that UBI, as it's dubbed, could be in future, linked to a person's willingness to comply from anything from vaccinations and tax paying to towing the government line on social media and in public. All that aside, uh, the best case scenario is that it's an out-and-out -out socialist policy, which is why Rishi Sunak is now being pressured by, wait for it, failed London Mayor Sadiq Khan to consider unleashing the policy in Britain. Pro-UBI campaigners have likened the proposed replacement of means-tested benefits with a regular flat rate payment to the formation of the NHS. Uh, and the Prime Minister has been told in an open letter signed by 205 supporters that the, quote, modest payment for basics like food, transport and bills would be enough to prevent struggling households being tipped into poverty when the next crisis hits. Carol McGiffin, what on earth is Sadiq Khan doing supporting this globalist it's sinister not to policy? Do with him anyway. He's, he's also writing a book about the climate emergency, isn't he? Oh my God, he's. Oh, I don't know who's more awful, him or Rishi, at the moment. <laughs> I mean, here we go again, more free money. Yay! Where's it all so coming from? So what's this from? about, Carol? What's, well, universal, where's this push coming th from? This this push is coming from basically trying to, I think, to make everyone a dependent on the state and then you are dependent on them for your for your lives right you have to do everything you become a slave almost and 
You do. You will have to abide by certain rules to get the money. It's, it will be tied, like you say, to the digital ID, to um, your carbon footprint as well. So if you buy the wrong food, et cetera, et cetera, there's you no, won't get your money. To suggest this that. is nothing. No, 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 not You're yet. You're hypothesising. Amy. Not, not, and no, it's not. It's all written down in this in the globalist playbook. The Great Reset. Have you not read it? No. Of course you have, because you still think it's a conspiracy theory. Which do, it do you, isn't. Amy? Do you think I it's think a conspiracy what, theory? I think what you're saying about the prospect of universal basic income is a, really not the case at all. It's they really want. They want everyone to be dependent on the state. Or maybe they want. That's why they want you everyone are, to own nothing. And have oh, you not be happy? noticed that people are already quite dependent on the state? But the case oh, at the moment How come? Why? is because there's no because, the economy. Because they made everyone stay at home for two the, years. The poorest people have never been poorer. We have a massive poverty problem in this G7 country that we live in, and this is a way. By the to way, provide... I, am, I am going to interrupt you again, and I'm afraid to say because. Uh, the poorest have been a lot mm -hmm. poorer, I mean. Yeah. No, the, yeah, the space right. between yeah. the poorest and the richest has never been greater. Yeah, but the poorest have been poor. There's a difference. If it's you... tripled the amount this, of destitution the, the in this country. <laughs> for, a, for a G7 country, is unacceptable. And this policy, which it sounds perfect because it's supported on the right, because no, it's, not. it's yeah. supported on the right in part because it encourages economic growth and it's supported on the left because it encourages social justice. How can something Sean, that you're provides... shaking your head about this policy. I, I, I've got to say a couple of things. The, the gap between the richest and the poorest is bigger than it's ever been. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm hold saying. Hold on, because we have some very, very, very rich... That was something you rich, just said wasn't true. We have some very, very rich you people. Know, you said the, you said the poorest have never, have been, never been poorer. poorer. That, that isn't true. The... Actually, the most une unequal nation in Europe is probably the Netherlands because of the old wealth there, because they invented banking, families passed on wealth. Don't forget all the but, wealth transfer yeah. that's been But the most place. important thing about UBI is it takes money away from the poorest people. So if you and I are earning bundles of money, they'll take some money and give it to us. If you're poor and you're getting a, a, lot, a high level of support, maybe you're disabled, maybe you're single parents, your money will be lowered. So actually, it takes money from the poorest people. The other thing as well is work. Work isn't just about money. Most people meet the people they marry at work. It gives you network, it gives you purpose. But this is exactly... And if you look at what happened in, 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 in poor communities in America where they had high levels of unemployment, they didn't go and become artists. They got, they got into drugs and, I mean, and antisocial... Why, 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 why the hell, Amy, you... should, should I be given a universal basic income by the state? That's yeah. sick. The point of it. No, 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 is, but why? Explain okay, why. Okay, I'll explain why. Because if you give everyone a conditionless, universal income, it means that people are not working solely to survive. Your survival is taken but care it's of. Not going so to it be gives you the opportunity to earn more, learn, care. It takes away the stigma of receiving social payments. So, so the... And what the money that. Uh, uh, no, go on. No, because I can't, because you keep just smirking at me constantly. Can, can I just... No, I just, I'm not. I'm not. I, just, I, just, I think the policy I, I, I is just, insane. I think it's insane that you smirking. think I should be given uh, an, a, a, a weekly payment the, or a monthly the, so, payment by the state. Okay. I do not... When we're I, around, I, I will never understand Why don't that. we just look at where the pilots have taken place in Canada, in in... Finland and look at the way that improved mental well-being of the society and when you do that you reduce crime and you take away the strain on the NHS and you save money and that's Carol, actually, does she have a point? That's actually no. what funds it. No, no, no. I mean, well, saving I think, money and I looking think, after people—it's ridiculous, isn't yeah, it? I think the point of it is, is not really to just to give it to everybody right now. It's to break people so that they don't have any money left, so their mortgages will go up to, you know, extortionate rates. They won't be able to afford to pay them. The banks will take your house back. You, nobody will have any money. In the end, everyone will need to have free money from somewhere, but all that money will be transferred to the people who are the richest people in the world now. And it's been happening for a long, long time. This is what the wealth transfer is about. This is what COP27 is about. This is what all of those things is, uh, is about. We're paying, everyone will pay on the lowest levels. And eventually, you, you'll have to take handouts from people and you'll become a slave to the state. Final this word, is a just, long just way off, but it's going Even if I take Amy's model, there's no conditions. There's definitely an impact. If you make working not pay, it will push up the cost of basic goods, which will make the poorest people even poorer than they are now. This has an impact, and it's why many Disability groups, for instance, worry because yeah. targeted well, payments people get isn't it? more. It's just communism. Communism doesn't work. Now, over in America, the results have been announced for Miss Greater Derry, a local beauty pageant held by the Miss America organization.
And the winner is the transgender contestant Brian Nguyen. Here's the moment the victory was announced. Can we skip to the good part? Is, is that right, Carol, do you think? <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. I, I think... I, the thing is, when you say anything about this kind of um, behaviour or culture, if you like, it's, it's, it's a minefield, isn't it? Yeah. It is a well, minefield. Well, you're accused but... of being transphobic, aren't you? Well, of course, yes. And in, I'm not being transphobic. I just think that, you know, these girls are having their chance taken away from them and they're applauding it. Yeah, well, I... they seemed happy, sure. I, I, I just think it's another thing we're taking away from women. Let's be clear, this is not about being transphobic. If you want to allow men, women or trans people to win an event, call it that. Don't call it Miss. Mm. For me, Miss mm. suggests a particular thing. They should say this is a people's beauty contest and then it'll be fine. Or have but... their own event, yeah. have a trans well, no, no, event. Mix, what, what do you mix, think, mix everybody Amy? up, let them know. Um, I think that that person's a legal woman and you're all obsessed with genitals and you just want to know what that person's genitals is and that's all that's important to you and that defines everything. Actually, what I'm obsessed with... I think that's with, a bit I, 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 have a, I have a young daughter and a son and I look at them and I want them both to have the same opportunities. And we've done a few extra things for women, not enough, but this is one of the things that women have, have generally owned. You take away a lot of opportunity when you do this. It reminds me how it plays itself out in sport and in the workplace. And I think it's... So if your son or daughter says, Dad, I'm trans, what will your next step be? Don't enter a woman's beauty contest. So you'll deny that you're trans daughter is a woman? No, I will tell her, right... No, my, be your son. My, I will tell my son that the, the journey of women through the history of the Western world has been tough. Be very careful not to remove mm. the rights that have been hard fought for, for by women and arguably still need to be so. I think the journey for trans women is slightly more difficult. No, nope, they're I'd, more likely I'd... to be in domestic abuse, in prison, uh, related to crime, every single terrible thing that could possibly happen, they're more likely to I, have it I happen. take the historical view on women. They've had the rough end of the stick for time and memorial. You only have to look at rape mm. conviction rates. You only have to look at how many women are murdered by their own partner. So I actually the think rape, women But have the rate for trans thing. women in both those areas is greater. Okay. And, Last piece is yes. women actually have to go through childbirth. It's how we all get here, trans or not. Not all women. Childbirth doesn't make you a woman. Amy Cowell, <laughs> Sean Bailey, Karen McGiffin, thank you so much. And my superstar panel are going to return in just a moment to reveal tonight's greatest Britain and union jackass. But next, Peter Kay is back and attempting to navigate a comedy scene where cancel culture is out of control. But will he do anything about it? Man of the people. Charlie Lawson takes on the Woke Week. Uh, first, a very quick look at Monday's show. Coming up on Dan Wotton tonight, with Boris Johnson's Dementia Task Force in jeopardy amid the cost of living crisis, the widower of the late great Dame Barbara Windsor, Scott Mitchell, implores Rishi Sunak to keep fighting for those impacted by this horrendous disease. It's an emotional interview you don't want to miss. And as ever, Dan will break down the top headlines of the day with his superstar panel, Carol Malone, Nigel Nelson and Belinda De Lucy. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursday, 9pm to 11pm on GB News. But it's time now for Uncancelled. And this is where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Now, comedy legend Peter Kay delighted fans this week by announcing his first tour in 12 years. But he's emerging from the wilderness into a very different and woke world. And while appearing on the Zoe Ball Breakfast show on the BBC yesterday, he slammed cancel culture after the show's host jokingly referenced the now controversial 1969 Ken Dodd creation, Diddy Men, during a misheard lyrics game. He must be a fan of Ken Dodd. He just shouts it out randomly. It's so true. You like the Diddy Men? Oh, yeah. Can't say that, mate. No, it's not allowed. Oh, is it not? No. Okay. Can't say anything. That's what I should have called me to. You can't oh, say anything anymore. I know. You've got to be you. careful. Backlash. Well, I'm delighted to say our man of the people, Charlie Lawson, is here to take on the Woke Week. And, Charlie, I mean... While it's good to see comedians standing up to woke culture, do you think uh, Peter Kay will do anything about it? Because he clearly knows there, doesn't he, that there is some sort of issue. 
Yeah, look, uh, he he he's the man to do it. You know what I mean? His live shows are wonderful, and uh, if he takes a leaf out of Ricky Gervais's book, um, the, then he 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 can he can lead us back from the wilderness, so to speak. Um, so I hope he does, and I think he probably will embrace it. He's a, he's a very funny man, and as Rowan Atkinson said, who's not a bad comedian himself. Um, you know, humor, you can't edit humor. It ha you know, a good joke is a good joke as long as it's not deliberately, violently offensive. Uh, we all know what I'm talking about. Um, but Peter is the man to do it. And also, if he bothers his rear end to just think of Billy Connolly for for 10 seconds and just Google some of the stuff that Billy, do, Billy did, God bless him, um, he opened the door and he never, ever shut it. Um, okay. You know, he, he, the king of comedy and no political correctness whatsoever. So, But Peter is the man... You know, to do it, he's a, he's a funny man, and if he follows Ricky Gervais and Billy Connolly, he could do a hell of a lot worse. I hope you're right. Uh, now, look, Charlie, I, I think I, I want to f uh, speak about the wokest story of the week, though. Okay, and this is a university watchdog has published its proposed <laughs> guidance to decolonize mathematics. So this is the Quality you know Assurance what? Agency who said the curriculum should present a multicultural and decolonised view and students should be made aware of problematic issues in the history of mathematics, including slave trade links and discriminatory statements by pioneers in the field. I mean, Charlie, uh, come on, can we just call this out and say this is nonsense? I mean, it's maths. It's maths. You're a very kind man, Dan, so you are. It's absolute shite. I mean, I, I cannot believe that this is going on in our universities, you know. I mean, what is, oh, I what is colonial about a right-angled triangle, for God's sake, you know? And also, I mean, if we, if we want to take it, we all know if you want to take history back two or 300 years, you're going to find some skeletons and some cupboards. It's as simple as that. I mean, where do we stop? You know, are we going to are we going to go to Egypt and say, right, you better bulldoze those bloody pyramids because they were built by slaves? I mean, where does this end? This nonsense, you know. And that sadly, this is a university. This is where young people go to learn about the world. Never mind their their degree or whatever, you know. And I just can't help think. I mean, what Oxford were on about something about a month ago. I remember we talked about that. So it it it's baffling and and very very. I think it's depressing. All this really is. It pisses me off. So it does, Dan. I'm sorry. No, me too, Charlie. Perfectly put. Our man of the people, Charlie Lawson, on the woke week. Thank you, Charlie. We will speak next week. But it's time now to reveal tonight's greatest Britain and union jackass. Carol McGiffin, who is your greatest Britain nominee? Well, it's got to be Mike Tindall, actually, who's, uh, who I think it should win um, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. I've stopped watching it because Matt Hancock's yeah. in there, but the way he's called him out and said everything he's been saying is BS. And the way he rescued them from that spider, I mean, oh, my God, he's just my hero. We love Mike Tindall. Yep. so with you there. Sean Bailey, your nominee. My um, Greatest Britain nominee is the John Lewis Christmas ad, which depicts yeah. a dad learning to skate to build a relationship with his foster daughter. You all know me. I'm about family. I think it's a great advert to sort of point to what's really important in life. I'm the guy who hopes Harry and William come back together as brothers, so it's no surprise I've picked this. Yeah, yeah, no, good choice. OK, Amy Nicole, your nominee? Um, mine is the NHS doctor, Wahid Aryan, who I think should be the face you think of when you discuss or think about the migrant crisis as he arrived here on the back of a lorry from Afghanistan. Yes, and, of course, uh, he was a legitimate asylum seeker yeah, from Afghanistan. Yeah, he was on the back of a lorry. So of course... I agree that we should look after someone like him, of course. Uh, but greatest friend's got to be Mike Tindall. What a man. What a dude. Uh, Union Jack has time now, though. Carol, who are you going for? Oh, um, it's got to be Piers Morgan again. <laughs> I think this is about my fifth time nominating him. Um, after what he's trying to do, the backtracking thing that they're all trying to do, the kind of, you know, let's just move on. I got it wrong. I believe the science. Well, Piers, I don't believe you believed the science and you carried on discriminating against and blocking anybody who questioned it. So 
The answer to your is, can we move on? No, we can't. Sean Bailey, your nominee. My nominee is the Unite and RMT Union for the, for the train strikes and all the disruption they're causing. Of course, we'd all love a big pay rise, but it's tough times. And they need to remember it's the British public that has to find the money, not the government. So you're asking oh, people yeah. who are suffering pay rises at work to pay you no, even couldn't more. couldn't agree more. You need to think twice. Couldn't agree more. Amy Nicole, your union jackass, please, don't make it me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's David Williams. Oh, so there's another for... DW. Yeah, it's code. <laughs> um, no, for sending these... Oh, no, he didn't send text, sorry. Throwing me off. For, for being lewd, basically, undercover to... A yeah, he's he been the on... victim of... While he was on Britain's Got Talent... He's been the victim was, of a leak um... to The Guardian newspaper. Again, I have some issues with this because he was talking off camera. Yeah, but the things he said are unacceptable on or off camera. So that's why he's my... Union Jacker. Okay, well, look, I'm going to go with Sean and these dastardly unions, but what a fabulous superstar panel tonight. <laughs> McGiff, Sean Bailey, and Amy Nicole. I'm back Monday night at nine o'clock. Headliners is up next, so have an amazing weekend. Mark Dolan is here tomorrow. Good night. We are GB News. And we'd like to say thank you. To each and every one of you. For helping our great nation. Find its voice. We're absolutely everywhere. Across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. On TV. On radio. And online. We're proud to be the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. You've been cancelled. Join the club.